to Beholder to No One, a D&D podcast. Today I'm here with Steven from Fae Forge Academy. Hello. Glad to be here. Yeah, it's exciting. And we're just, we're going to talk about quite a few things, but mostly like world building and sandboxing and like just a whole bunch of whatever we spill out. Yeah, nerd about. stuff. Nerd stuff. My favorite <laughs> topics. Exactly. Nerd stuff. So tell us a little bit about Fae Forge Academy for those who aren't aware. Okay, yeah. So Fae Forge Academy is a fifth edition. You can keep that in. I don't care. <laughs> Fae Forge Academy is a fifth edition D&D podcast set in a homebrew world of my making called Avastria, but it centers around the Fae Forge Academy, which is a school of magical crafting. The Fae Forge Academy itself is built where the material plane and the Feywilds have a lot of crossover, where the veil between those two planes overlaps. And it follows our six students kind of through their adventures as they unlock secrets of times from long ago as to what the castle actually really was. And their stories are all weaving together. And it's a lot of fun. It sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. I have caught like little bits and pieces of the show. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying desperately to catch up on some other stuff so I can like <laughs> listen to all of my friends' stuff. I feel like that's the like the story of being a podcaster is like you have all these other podcast friends making stuff, and you're like, "Wow, I really want to listen to this show and that show and this show and also that show." And I don't have time, so yeah. I've listened to like one episode of 37 different podcasts, and I don't remember which one is which, and. <laughs> I feel called out right now. <laughs> I've heard some, the pieces that I've heard from your editing streams, I've enjoyed, even though some of them, it's like, oh, it's repetitive. So if I enjoy it while you're editing it, I'm sure I'll enjoy it. When I'm yeah, I feel like to that, it. that makes me feel really good. <laughs> but I'm, I'm really lucky too, that I have, I have a really, really good and creative cast that like dives head first into like lore and world building and stuff. So yeah. So when you started building Fay Forge, mm -hmm. I heard this partially a little bit today, so I'm going to pretend I didn't hear it. Okay. When you started Fay Forge, you started your realm and then did you build your world with your players or did you go into it saying, this is the world, do with it as you will? So kind of a, it was kind of like a combination of both of those. So when I start campaigns or I start like a new homebrew world, I always start just by making a map. I don't know. Like, and I just put geographical features on it and make it into a pretty map. That's how I start world building. And then I go from there. And so I made my map of Avastria and I liked it. And then I decided, actually, I'll go back a little further. I think it was 2019 when the witchcraft supplement from Astrologo Press came out, which is a craft, a really, really cool crafting system for 5e. I think I saw you share that before. Yeah. I, I highly recommend it. It's it's really fun and adds a lot of fun potential like role play and stuff and crafting, which I think D and D lacks in mechanics. Even like the Xanathar stuff isn't super great. So that came out and I started reading it and I was a I was a Kickstarter backer and stuff. And I was like, I was like, this is like perfect for a magic school that focuses on like creating magical tools or instruments or art or whatever, magical crafting. So I knew I wanted to do a magic school and I knew I wanted it to be in this on this map somewhere. So I plug that in. And then when I when I make campaigns, I don't really do too much. I give like little bits and pieces of like, hey, this is like this is the Fae Forge Academy. This is what I want your students to be doing. Let's figure out where your characters come from in the world. And since this is a brand new world, it's literally like a, a whiteboard. You can put whatever you want on it and let's work work at it and then let's turn it into something that's cohesive and fits together really well. And so they my players started kind of talking about who their characters were, where they came from, what they wanted to be. And then that started to shape a little bit more of the world. And there's still, there's still, I would say 95% of our world map is unexplored. Right. And, and left to, to be filled in. We just added a new cast member in January and her character started to fill out another section of the map where I was like, okay, this is the very, very general idea of what this area is. And she was like, yeah, I want to be from there. Let's talk about that. And so then we worked together to kind of 
take that really rough idea and fine tune it and turn it into something that's a little bit more fleshed out. Yeah, fleshed out. I'm not going to say too much about it because a lot of that hasn't Spoilers. come out in the show yet. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's fine. But it's it's really cool because because that way the whole story has been shaped by these characters and their influence on the world. Even from uh, we have a custom pantheon and one of our characters is an Asimar. But instead of like kind of traditional D&D where it's like the Asmar was born to human parents and we're blessed by the gods in our world, Asmar actually are from the celestial realm. Like they live there. Their families are from there. That's cool. And the celestial realm is broken up into different realms of which god god or goddess rules that area. And so and she wanted to her goddess to be named Sala, who is the goddess of justice. And that's where she's from. And she's a Valkyrie. So she gave me probably a paragraph basically that was that. And then I and then I took that and turned it into how this god slots into the pantheon. We have another character who is a celestial warlock who and this and in like our session zeros, he wanted his patron to be a Valkyrie, which the Valkyries are the like the warriors that the Asmar is actually from and a part of. Mm -hmm. And so then we had this connection there. And so then I got to take that and turn and start intertwining both of their lore together and then creating this this really really fun kind of deep and connected story between those two characters and then it, and then it keep it keeps branching out and connecting other pieces that's really fun the first time i used the let the players decide was in my most recent game that i'm doing mm -hmm. that's it's not recorded it's just like a monday for game for fun yeah and our session 0 was like okay, tell me about your characters and let's connect. But then it was, all right, I got a couple questions. Mm -hmm. There's a, I had a map and I was like, there's a city to the north of you. What's its name? What kind of government does it have? What are the prominent races there? Mm -hmm. What are its exports and imports? And with that information, I was able to create a basis of a city and every person had an answer in those cities. So they all had a little bit of a say. And it's led to some really interesting combinations that I had to make work. Yeah, for sure. But I think I think what's so cool when you start doing this like more collaborative campaign and world building is you come up with these worlds and these situations that you can't come up with on your own. Yeah. And and the other thing that I've found is the more as a DM or GM, depending on <laughs> what you prefer the more you let your p players like invest and shape the whoa punch my mic invest and shape your world the more invested they are in the game as well because because they know they see the connections and stuff they don't it's not only you as the in the dms knowing that there's connections that are for them it's like oh i remember this character like i want to go talk to them and see what like came of this idea and and, and see what's happening in the world and stuff yeah, and I, I liked having them all create their own hometown. Mm -hmm. Like I haven't I need to discuss with them little bits and pieces about it, but right now it's not prevalent to the story. So we haven't really dived into what's your hometown actually like? Like what yeah. was it? Like I know a little bit about each of their own personal backstories, mm -hmm. but they all made their own town and they also made a couple of I was like, what are some things that are rumored that may or may not be true? And some of these may not be true at all. Yeah. Like there could just be rumors. Like there's a rumor that there is a half giant who lives in the mountains who controls all the weather. Oh, beautiful. But there's also a rumor of a city on top of the back of a, a turtle, a giant turtle that lives nice. to the south. So one of those could be true. Neither of those could be true. Both could be true. Who knows? Mm -hmm. Like there's just and I keep tying those in. So like they found a book and I, I use a lot of random generators. Mm -hmm. And one of the random generators was ancient turtle. And they're like, <laughs> Is that about the city? I'm like, is it yep, the turtle? Sure is. It's a <laughs> mythological book about how a person's mad mm -hmm. writings, just like in the comments saying things that don't make sense. But he's he's convinced that <laughs> it's still there. That's amazing. I love that. That's so good. Yeah. It, it so something that's really interesting, at least that I've observed about, especially in Dungeons and Dragons, particularly, is people really like sandbox, like the idea of sandbox style. RPGs, right? And and I have found that you can't really do those without investment from your players because they have to know about the world a little bit more. They have to they have to have deeper connections already. They have to have 
backstory. They have to have all those things. Because if you just say like, what players are you playing? And they have like a one sentence, like not really deeply thought out backstory, just pick the city off of a random map. And they're like, okay, I'm, I'm a, I'm a fighter. I'm an orc fighter or half orc fighter. Let's do this. And you're like, okay, so you're in this town. What do you want to do? Then, then everyone's like, um, I, uh, I don't know. We go to the tavern. <laughs> yeah. But because as a DM, even in a sandbox setting, you have to like kind of push people in certain directions or else there's no story. Cause it, it just are, I, I feel like personally, RPGs don't really work if there's not some sort of connecting point, some sort of motivation, something pushing the players one way or the other and how they respond to that is totally up to them yeah i've, I've heard of the the illusion of sandboxing mm -hmm. and like i'm trying to like embrace sandbox method mm -hmm. but also like it's kind of railroad as well like i'm giving choices mm -hmm. but i also have pre-planned those choices so i'm like okay you have these three things that you have to choose from which one would you like to do and yeah typically they could do something else mm -hmm. but Please don't <laughs> <laughs> see. See, I think one of the things that helps with being able to say, like, here's three choices. And then if they throw another choice at you, you're like, OK, like, let's roll with it is when you have a when you're in a point in the story or you have enough understanding of the characters in the story and the world that's around them that you can you can start reacting more to it, if that makes sense. Yeah, like I have. The more I've the more I've DM'd, the more I've gotten comfortable with being able to just like be like, okay, these were the plot hooks I threw at, at them. They completely ignored it because they're players and they're a bunch of chaos goblins. <laughs> but I don't know anything about that. <laughs> but like so in 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 Fae Forge, right? We're centered around a school. So we have this central location that every session is getting fleshed out and built out a little bit more and 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 a little bit more. So there's more NPCs that I that I know more about. I know what the characters are looking for. I know who who's on campus, who's not on campus. I know the area around the campus. Mm -hmm. And that makes it a little easier so that when I do have like big plot hooks that take them further away, I'm like, okay, this is this this is where it becomes a little bit more linear, but not not because I'm forcing them into that, just because of them following the trail that I'm leading or or the plot hooks or or whatever, pull them in a certain direction. And then they come back and they have space to like to look for new for new plot hooks that I have planned and some that I don't. And to 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 kind of do the more day to day stuff, the more the more sandboxy stuff as they come back from these little like quests and stuff. So it like it's this balance between between like we need you need narrative direction and goals but as a dm our our job is really to be flexible with those and help help guide them as opposed to like like be like this is where you have to go you have to go to the troll on the mountain and then you have to find the magic item and you have to take the magic item to the town and then the town has to send you to like it doesn't have to be that structured yeah but it does have to like there there has to be consequences for action or inaction i guess yeah, so like, oh, here's your plot hooks. Okay, cool. We're gonna go bar hopping. Oh well, <laughs> plot hooks still happening. Yeah, like forty eight hours later. Oh, uh, you hear screaming down mm -hmm. the street. Well, why? It's like the person that you've avoided to stop trying to find. They're currently murdering somebody. You missed it. <laughs> I did mention that there was like a a ban a mercenary bandit camp, like terrorizing the village and this is the this is the terrorizing part that i had mentioned earlier in the plot hook yeah remember that terrorize <laughs> part the bandit no no doesn't ring a bell well i told you about that four sessions ago yeah and uh the bandits have now <laughs> killed 12 people <laughs> they're the richest people in the town now <laughs> and they summoned a demon so hooray <laughs> good job but you guys got drunk <laughs> so proud of you <laughs> well we really needed a day off though I can't say shit like I, there are characters <laughs> that I'll play that are chaotic as fuck and uh -huh. I get yelled at for it all the time. And there's characters that are very, very hyper focused and like mm -hmm. we need to do the job. They're still a little chaotic. Yeah, um, I think all my characters are chaotic, but for the most part, like there have been times where it's like, oh, yeah, we had a deadline. Shit. Uh, <laughs> OK, uh, we should go handle <laughs> that. Yeah.
I that's one of my favorite parts of RPGs is the unforeseen consequences. Yeah. But but yeah, the like like where when when you have players or when you are a player and you're like, oh, this is really fun. I'm gonna do this crazy thing. And then and then crazy thing has crazy consequence also that you're like, oh no, I did not see I I didn't mean to summon a summon a dragon. Uh we'll deal with this. Sorry, town. So there was a it was a funny situation and it didn't end badly surprisingly but it could have if it was a different dm i think (laughs) so i played in dragon heist and i've told this story before but in the game i played roya a druid vidalkin who was very much a hippie like Mm -hmm. she really liked to get high all the time she sold random drugs to people (laughs) She had a weaving company. She was a very successful business owner. Mm-hmm. But she started dating Jurlaxel, one of the bad guys mm-hmm. in the book. And he was technically using her in like her tavern. But she's like, no, he's a nice guy. What are you talking about? And it could have very much gone. Nope, he's still just a bad guy. And he wants nothing to do with you. He was just abusing your trust. But it didn't go that way. Because the entire time, I'm just like, no, he's a great guy. What are you talking about? He just really wants this really big sword. Did you did you know who he was, like, out of character? Uh, Yeah, out of character I did. Nice. Well done. <laughs> I knew he was a bad guy. I didn't know much about him beyond that. Gotcha. Gotcha. But my character in character was very much free love and everything yeah, like that. Like, and no. she's just like, he seems like a great guy. And he was flirting with her. She's like, okay, okay. <laughs> All about this. <laughs> I'll go on a date with you. It's fine. And then he like gifted her a wand of flowers, which didn't seem like much until she realized that weed is a flower and she could <laughs> grow her own weed and make her own like weed empire. <laughs> it was great. That's fantastic. Yeah. And then like at the end, it was kind of like it could have gone either way because she couldn't get the item he wanted because like he, he mm. offered he helped her or helped their party in exchange for one specific item out of this treasure hoard that we were going to get. Yeah. And Roya agreed, not knowing what the item was. Turns out it belongs to the thing guarding the fucking place. (laughs) And it did not want to give it up and we could not take it on. So I'm like, um, so I can't do that. So it could have very well been like, oh, well, you're useless. Okay, bye. But it did not go that route. And I was like, oh, thank God. Happy endings. (laughs) So now Roya and him are going to be on his boat circus for the next five years, raising their child until we <laughs> go to the uh, next book. Oh, that's fantastic. I love that. Do you DM or do you play more? I currently play more, but I do DM as well. Okay. I DM once a week currently. I'm mean, going to have been DMing once a week for about, I've been DMing for about eight years, mm-hmm. but once a week for maybe about two years nice. and i think prior to that i was dming a little bit i just don't remember beyond two years ago <laughs> that's fair the last the, the last year or so has occupied a lot of all of our minds so yeah i i play currently in two off non-recording games mm-hmm. one is ending soon and i think i might drop out of it even though they're going to continue a system but they're going to go into like i think they want to do curse of strahd and i'm just like "Ah, i don't want to do curse of strahd again that's fair like i've started it like a thousand times i just (laughs) i'm done i don't like i'm never gonna beat it if we play it. yes i'm not going i'm I'm not going into mist fine i get it i won't go into the mist (laughs) but mostly it's just most of my games are for recordings now beyond that same same. I have an at-home game that we don't meet consistently, mm-hmm. but we probably play it twice a month, and then and then I do Fae Forge and streaming and stuff. But much more recorded playing than just at-home playing. Which actually that that brings me to a question for you: Do you feel like there's a a significant difference between your recorded games and your at-home games? A little, a little. So in some of my at-home games, I'm more comfortable and confident and able to go into like darker storylines so i really like reading horror and reading thrillers and reading books that have taboos and things that are bad yeah and i while i don't agree with any of those in reality in stories it adds something to this like creepy shitty situation that people are in 
and also adds a little bit of realism to a point, even though I know that's what most people want escapism. And so that's mm -hmm. completely legit. So I have played some really scary fucking games where like yeah. my character is on a meat hook in the back of a van and being tortured <gasps> for information. Oh God. <laughs> right. And those aren't necessarily games I would be willing to play or DM or mm -hmm. in, in a recording setting. Yeah. I've played games where NPCs, not that I was DMing, but this like NPCs were sexist or racist. Mm -hmm. And that was that one character that was like that. And we fucking hated that character <laughs> the yeah. entire time. Yeah. So in other games also, it's like it's it's so much more lax. Mm -hmm. The hardest disconnect I've had with personal games and games for recording is that I need to think of games that are being recorded more as a producer mm -hmm. and less as a player or a DM, which yeah. that was my hardest thing to jump from. And it, it didn't take until recently, actually, to actually see that. Mm -hmm. So I've been like when we started Behold Clearlight, which is our horror-esque actual play game that we're currently playing. My brain was just like, oh, cool. It's another campaign. We're going to play it forever until it eventually like just dies off or is like naturally ended like it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Never thought, oh, there's going to be an ending at some point and I'll have yeah. to think of a next step. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's those are, those are good points. I think I've actually I've I've actually done more playing for recordings than I have for just like at home stuff because of how life has turned out yeah and and it, it is interesting i think i think one of the things that is that i have found is is my, my dming style is my dming style like i don't really change that much from a once the game has started standpoint mm -hmm. i'm much more aware of like story beats and like trying to make sure that the story pushes forward at a at, at a better pace yeah in recordings than like at home if if we're having fun and they want to spend an entire session like shooting the shit in the bar like great let's do it yeah i i noticed that too with the way that ryan dms i absolutely love his dming style but like about an hour and a half into the recording because we'll do two hours and mm -hmm. max for an episode and then we'll take a break and then do two hours mm -hmm. and record two episodes and i'll be like hey it's been an hour and a half you got about 30 minutes to find a cool way to end it because he loves cliffhangers with a passion i've gotten very good at ending episodes like that where because because we actually we're we're similar we do we record two hour and a half sessions and i like because because you're thinking as like a producer like you want the listeners to like be like oh my gosh i can't wait till the next episode comes out yeah and and so i'm always 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 looking for like like I'll end I'll end episodes in the middle of initiative in like in the in the middle of a fight or the my favorite thing to do is like if there's a plot hook that hadn't that the players didn't like kind of touch or anything like that I will I'll like drop that in as the last thing that happens in a session be like and you see this mysterious this pair of eyes sticking out from the closet or whatever yeah let's see what happens next time on the Fayforge Academy and they're always like Steven no Ryan's done that a couple of times where it ends on this weird thing or it'll end like on this person speaks up and says something. You're like, oh, ho, ho, who do we have here? And mm -hmm. that's where we're going to end. I'm like, who is it? What's going on? What's yeah. happening? What is, are we in trouble? <laughs> tell me more. Tell me more. Do we need adults? <laughs> so there have been times where like, a random monster will appear or an NPC will appear and there's like always something. Mm -hmm. The last episode we just recorded, we tied in a couple of, there were four cliffhangers in one episode and I don't know how he did that. Beautiful. That's and beautiful. Like, well done. What is happening? So I'm of course like, Ryan, no, what is happening? What is going on? And I have to wait two weeks. <laughs> Our last cliffhanger was, so we deal with lots of fake creatures in our story mm -hmm. and i our our party got in a fight with a water nymph mm -hmm. and the the nymph pulled one of our players underwater and so i ended with him not being able to breathe underwater which was very fun very nice it's like well you might die you might not yeah. i don't know but you have to wait for two more weeks to find out yeah there was a there was it wasn't a recorded game this was from my old monday game 
the players were sneaking into a house and this was in a kind of like a red light district city. It was based off of the red light districts or what I know of it. Mm -hmm. So each area had its own leader and it was very much crime lord esque. Mm -hmm. So they were breaking into the home of the woman who ran the adult friendship, let's say, (laughs) group. Mm -hmm. And they were breaking in to steal her treasure, I think it was. So I had planned, I didn't plan a lot, but I planned enough that I was like, okay, so they're going to go in and there's going to be a door and on the door handle will be a teleportation spell. Mm -hmm. And when they touch it, they will teleport to where the dragon is guarding all of the horde that belongs to the leader. Nice. So two of the players touched the handle and then a third player dispelled magic on the handle. Oh no. Thinking it was a trap and that they would come back. But that's not what happened because that's not what it was. So I said, okay, you both look up or you both stand up in a different room and feel heavy breathing, very warm breath on the back of your neck as all of your hair and clothes get pushed forward from it. And when you glance behind you, there is a green dragon. And that's where we're going to end tonight. (laughs) Oh, no. And then the other character is just like, oh, no, what did I do? Pretty much. (laughs) That's awesome. I told the two players, I'm like, I don't know what's going to happen. But this is a deadly encounter are all five of you. And there are two of you. (laughs) What happened? So I told them to make new characters. And the next (laughs) session, I was going to, I had an out for them, but I didn't tell them that. So I said, okay, we're going to split you off into two groups. We'll start with this group. And they fought the dragon. These motherfuckers kill my damn dragon. (laughs) A triple deadly encounter. Classic. And I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? Okay, fine. You killed the dragon. And I counted. I did. I, I was keeping track of counters. And I was like, okay, the other three, it was two players, but three, one was an NPC. Mm-hmm. What are you guys doing? And they're like, do we hear the fighting? So I was like, yeah, sure. I decided that there was another entrance. There should, there would probably be another entrance than just the secret teleportation one mm-hmm. to the room, but it's behind a hidden w- a wall. So you don't, mm-hmm. won't see it. So they, roll to see if they can figure out where the noise is coming from roll really 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 well so they figure out but then they don't see a way around so then one of them casts true sight on themselves and can see through the wall now and like god damn (laughs) then i said okay well you see up ahead a knight who is guarding a woman who you recognize to be the person that wasn't supposed to be there the leader of the group Mm -hmm. or the crime lord family so the knight goes into the hall because the fighting noises have now stopped Mm -hmm. it's been about 25 seconds maybe in game what do you do they say i cast i bite on the woman and i'm like i don't know what that spell does because i've actually never (laughs) used it before but what it does is if they fail a certain save they go to sleep for a minute yeah no extra saves so lo and behold guess who fucking failed So they take her staff, they go into the room, they all kill this knight, and it's been now 30 seconds. Oh my gosh. And then they steal all the treasure, and they teleport out within a minute. One fucking minute of gameplay (laughs) took three and a half hours, and they got away without anybody living to have seen them. I think that's one of the funniest things about D &D and the combat mechanics is how slow or how different in game and out of game time is actually going during combats yes is hilarious because it makes things that that just aren't possible possible just because just because of time not not anything else yep that was the most absurd session i have ever dm'd yeah and i'm just like what the fuck just happened? <laughs> the only thing I did get on them was one of the items that they got was a ring. Mm-hmm. I did not plan ahead of time what it was. Mm-hmm. So I'd randomly decided it was cursed. Nice. So the rogue put it on because he was being greedy, mm-hmm. as rogues do. And it was cursed with 
a sentient person inside of it, only known as uh. Jack, <laughs> uh -oh. who continuously encouraged him to murder things. Oh, interesting. And give him blood a lot. Interesting. All the time. <laughs> and he could not take it off, even with the wish spell. That was specifically was in the instructions. Oh, wow. Yep. He that's had Jack crazy. the Ripper on his ring. <laughs> yeah. No, that's like, was there any way, like, could he like chop his hand off if he wanted to? Uh, technically, he could have probably that. chopped his hand off. He wouldn't have wanted to, but he could have. Yes, that was an option. <laughs> it didn't come into part very often, but every once in a while, I just would, I would just like send him private messages because it was on Discord saying, yes, I've never tried furbog blood before. <laughs> it's like, that's my friend. I'm not drinking his blood. But if you did, it would be delicious. <laughs> <laughs> but I bet it would be tasty. It's like, have you had any child delicacies recently like no no stop it stop it <laughs> crazy ring oh i love sentient artifacts we've got a couple in ours that are just starting to show themselves to their current owners that's cool which is fun i, I like it when they're sassy oh yeah <laughs> actually so we have a character who is uh the new drake warden on earth arcana class a rain it's a ranger and the character is a fairy so it's this little like 12 inch tall fairy that has a, a Drake pet. The way it's written, the, the way the rules are written for the Drake Warden is like you summon this Drake for a couple hours. We modified that a little bit to say basically most of the time this Drake has been cursed somehow and it has a connection with this player, which is going to be part of the character's backstory. But most of the time we have it as like it's basically like a tiny lizard that fits in the quill of this 12 inch tall fairy. but. <laughs> The fairy has named the the Drake Colonel and Colonel Colonel does not like the fairy and is just giving them all sorts of sass all the time. And it's very fun to role play. That actually sounds fantastic. We in Dragon Heist, there's the Stone of Galore. Mm -hmm. And then um, our barbarian had the Stone of Gal Galore that he, she kept calling Gloria and he just kept getting mad. <laughs> <laughs> so eventually he would answer just out of annoyance more than anything <laughs> and she's like gloria please please you must tell me like it was in a russian accent which i can't do but it was just so funny and then she had a sword that was super awesome and it's just like hey dude let's go kill shit <laughs> <laughs> what's up bro what's up bro let's go slay some let's go slay some things but um then my I felt bad because every time I play a character that can talk to animals, I will talk to every animal possible in the entire game. I'm that person. I need to know. That's my favorite. I actually I love DMing for characters who use who use speak with animals all the time. It's very fun. It's such a fun ability. Because <laughs> I like I like trying to I like trying to figure out like okay this animal has for the most part probably only communicated with other animals. So what is like what does a fox sound like when it talks? What is its what are what are its speech patterns? What's a what's a little sparrow? Like what are its speech patterns like? What does it know about? What does it not know about? What does it call things? What is it like I love I love I love doing that. Yeah. We uh broke into a pet store to free some pets. So we got a snake, a dog, and a cat from the pet store that we stole. Amazing. But we're we're the good guys, don't worry. <laughs> So I was like, what's your names? You have to give me your names. And Ashley is just like, what? I need their names. She's like, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> so the snake was Mr. Slithers. <laughs> well, yeah. Obviously. And Mr. S Mr. Slithers was amazing. He was my buddy. Did the snake call himself Mr. Sl Slithers? He did. Like his self-appointed name? Oh, that's, that's fantastic. He's, he's like, my name is Mr. Slithers. <laughs> and I'm like, yes. That's beautiful. I don't remember the cat's name, but the cat was rude. But nobody would believe me when I told them that the cat was rude. <laughs> I was like, no, that cat gets gave me the death glare. I'm not even kidding. I don't like your cat. I like all <laughs> animals. I don't like your cat. Amazing. And then the dog was called, oh, what was his name? I think it was Bork or something like that. <laughs> it was something silly like that. Yeah. And he was a blink dog that we found out later. Amazing. I love blink dogs. Blink dogs are fun. I got to, I, uh, Emily, who's in our, in, in my show was wrote this 
uh, shoot, what's it called? It's like a Halloween source book. It's on DM Skilled. It's called something. Really good ad. You're welcome, Emily. <laughs> we'll put it in the link down <laughs> below if we have it. One of the like the 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 first quest was you had to like there was like eight blink dogs that got like that broke out of like some cages from a from an animal trader or whatever, and he needed your help to try to just corral the eight blink dogs that were like blinking throughout the city and like causing like just causing animal chaos knocking over like food stands and like three or four of them like blinked into like a tavern and that scared sounds... all the patrons and stuff it was very fun fantastic yeah it was it was very it was a very good time the other thing that was really fun is she has in in the same same book and it, and i've used it in the fate forge academy as well a, di a different table but this idea of like using having wild magic tables that go off when there's like lots of extra magic in the air so like anytime any character casts a first level spell or higher you also roll on the wild magic table oh boy and the the halloween one which that's this that's the table is on like it gets real dark like my character a knife appeared in my hands after i cast a spell and i had an uncontrollable urge to kill the like the being that was closest to me oh boy and 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 there's all sorts of stuff like from that to there's like you do a banshee whale and everybody who who fails the save drops to zero hit points like <laughs> <laughs> there's all sorts of great stuff in there it's like there's a small chance of it happening but there's a chance mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i did a a one shot for 10 tabletop tales in december mm -hmm. which was where the pod squad we had 10 different podcasts mm -hmm. each do a one shot and then we released them all through december and it was a lot of fun i played in a lot of the games and i had a blast but the one i ran was everybody was a grimalkin uh -huh. which are fey cats i love it i'm into it and you can basically play it as a race and make a normal D, &D character as a grimalkin there are certain things you can't do mm -hmm. and it specifies you have to tweak it so like anything that has like, oh, you get a bonus because of armor, like you won't get that because you're a cat. But I played a, or I DM'd it, but the party was captured by a older woman mm -hmm. who had a love of cats. Yeah. I purposely did not say the normal term for it. <laughs> so they all wake up trapped in a house and there's like an orange tabby that's just like, I can get you out of here if you find my favorite ball of yarn. <laughs> and like all the descriptions were just like based off like the worst possible cat scenarios. Like the floor is sticky and smells heavily of cat urine because this isn't a room that gets cleaned very often. Oh, that's terrible. When they were leaving, she's also a hoarder. So there was the chance of like random objects just falling when they did certain things and when they finally fought her she was a a hag i made a new hag called the cat lady hag that's and i <laughs> tweaked her spells nice. so she had cat <laughs> oh no she had i'm face palming just so you know i just <laughs> i just want that clear for the for the audience <laughs> that's fine <laughs> <laughs> she had knitting needles instead of claws. She had cat nap, which was oh, just yeah. sleep. And because it was a I didn't I guess there is a cat nap spell, but it was a lesser one. And what was the other one that she had? I was like, I want to play all of them. Uh there is another one that she had that I cannot remember off the top of my head, but it also involved mm -hmm. cats in some way. Amazing. As one does. And then like they had to kill the, <laughs> the old lady in it was funny because like one of the players is like, oh, I use my ability to sense humanoids. And I'm like, is it specifically humanoids? <laughs> and they didn't catch on until later. They're like, no, I thought I sensed it. I'm like, doesn't fall under the category, you told me. <laughs> <laughs> the category? Uh, uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I'm a dad. This is my life. She was fun. That does sound fun. So where can everybody find you? I am on Twitter land is the easiest place. Probably my personal Twitter is at the underscore bad DM and Fay Forge Academy is at Fay Forge Academy, which is F A E F O R G E Academy. And but both of those are the same for Instagram, for Twitter, for Twitch. 
And then we also have a website that's fayforgeacademy.com. And we act, we also release a bunch of extra, extra content, like one-on-one chats with the cast. We have a stream every Tuesday that we do called Bedtime Stories with Brina, which are fairy tales, improv fairy tales that we make up on the spot with the help from people in chat and stuff. And then those get edited and released to our patrons as much cleaner produced stories that all are like part of the fairy tale lore of our world. Yeah, that's where you can find me in those places. And say say hi. I I like humans and I like talking with people and and stuff and things. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining. I really appreciate it. I just shared the cat lady in the descri- in discussions so you can oh, look well. over it. Beautiful. So, you guys can check us out in check them out specifically but check them out in the details down below and you can check us out on twitter at beholder to no one where i am always happy to chat uh you can always also find us on patreon on facebook kind of and (laughs) eventually on our website that was a very good description because we technically have a facebook too yeah (laughs) on facebook kind of i'm just being honest (laughs) i don't look at it at all it's because it's a it's the giant shit show (laughs) Facebook's a dangerous place. That is 100% accurate. Eventually, we also will have our website freshly built by my husband, and you can check out all his great work. If it's not up right now, hopefully it will be soon. Awesome. And that will be beholder to no onecom But yeah, so thanks again for joining. Yeah, absolutely. Everybody have a fantastic day. Goodbye. Bye.